folks, y'all got some work to do over on this side. <laughs> Big time work over here. And I know I'm not supposed to pick on people out the congregation, but y'all know what I'm supposed to do doesn't mean a thing. I appreciate the young lady who brought her coffee into the sanctuary and is enjoying her coffee with us. Thank you very much. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Hear the word of the Lord. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off, and he dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Well, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have back what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? then you ought to have at least invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talents from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For if to all those who have more, who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for the worthless slave, Throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. It's not quite the warm fuzzy that we sometimes expect to walk out of, is it? When my mother was pregnant with me, she did two things that I carry with me. I guess it's hardwired in my DNA. I was born the first week in September, so the last trimester it was hot. It was real hot. And she chewed ice cubes the whole time she carried me till birth. And I had grown up and all of my life I chomp on ice cubes during the summer. I try not to chomp loudly, but when I have a chance, I like ice cubes. The other thing that she did was she worked crossword puzzles. And those of you that work crossword puzzles know that that expands your vocabulary immensely because you get so frustrated when you look down and you see six empty squares. Just drives you crazy. Absolutely crazy. My dad was a newspaper editor. So he had to have a large vocabulary to say what he wanted to say. Well, I'm going to hit you with one of those big, long vocabulary words this morning that gives us a push into my message, and that word is epistemology. Many of you may know what epistemology is. If you don't, don't worry about it. It's not a word you're going to be using probably more than two or three times 
going down to dinner tomorrow night. So don't worry about epistemology. But what it is, is it's the study of knowledge. How do you know anything? How can we know what is true? Say epistemology with me. Epistemology. Oh, be a little more kind. Epistemology. If you take nothing else home with you today, you've learned a new word. There are many, many ways that we gain knowledge. But I want to give you four quick ones how easy it is sometimes for us to gain knowledge. And the first way we gain knowledge is through reason. And reason is real simple. How many fingers have I held up? Two. How many fingers have I held up? Two. If I add them together, how many have I got? Four. That's reason. One, two, three, four. You just got it. It's an equation that comes out of reasonability. The book of Hebrews, if you listened last week or week before, says the wisdom from above is open to reason. So, reason is the first way that we know things happen and things are true. The second thing is experience. It's a second way that we gain knowledge. See that there? I'm not going to put my finger much further down in there because I know what happens if I get much closer to it. I'm going to burn my finger. I've done that before. I know how experience works. We have all burned our finger. Therefore, we don't go near the fire and we certainly don't touch it. The blind man that Jesus healed was harassed by the Pharisees over Christ restoring his sight. And the blind man defended that incident in the book of John by appealing to his experience. Here his words. This one thing I know. I was blind, but now I can see. The third thing. We've got reason. We've got experience. The third thing is human authority. How many of you all were there in 1969 when the first man walked on the moon? How many of you were up, up there on the moon? Oh. <laughs> uh-huh. But, no, I didn't think so. But you know what? When Walter Cronkite told me, when Dan Rather told me, when Chet Huntley told me that they had walked on the moon, and when I saw the pictures come back, and I heard the voice say, one giant step and one small step, you know, I heard it from the authority of Walter Cronkite, that great television news actor who had all of these reporting skills that he had honed so quickly, and he said, and that's the way it is tonight. June, what up, 1969. Well, here's Walter Cronkite, or Chet Hunter, or Dan Rath. Here are several thousand years of authority, right here in this book, in the pages of our scripture. But there's one last means of knowledge. One last way we know. And that last mean is revelation. You know, like John's revelation. They're at the tail end of the Bible. Sometimes revelation is called conscience. Sometimes revelation is called intuition. Sometimes revelation is just simply called gut feeling. But regardless of how it works out, revelation to us as Christians is God's self-disclosure of who he is. A number of years ago, Pope John, on Christmas Day, went to prison to share God's love. And to those prisoners, he looked at them and he said, you could not come to me, so I came to you. That's revelation. That's Jesus in the form of man going to those in jail like we are commanded to. And Pope John Paul was revealing 
to those men the love of Jesus Christ. What we cannot learn about God through our own human speculation, God has disclosed to us our feeble reasoning. And folks, my reasoning is feeble. Our limited experience, our lack of authority has been so wonderfully surpassed by Jesus when he came to this earth preaching about the love of God. What are his words? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That, friends, is God's self-disclosure. If you really want to see God, look at Jesus. Look at the Son. This, then, is what the Bible is. This is it. It's a record. It is a record of the human experience with the Almighty. It's a reasonable appeal to my mind and to your mind. It's an authoritative statement of all of the knowledge we've gained, but more than anything else, more than anything else, friends, this book right here is God's self-disclosure to us of who He is. Now, when we read God's Word, we should read it with one question, one question above all else. And that question is, what is God like? Wouldn't you really love to have God come up here and sit down and just talk with us? Wouldn't you love for Him to stand here and talk with us? Wouldn't you love to have him, Kathy, in your Sunday school class and give us 30 minutes in a legal pad so we could talk with him and ask some questions? Well, that's not going to happen. But the answers he would give, they're right here. All we got to do is look for them. All we have to do is look for them. What is God like? Well, the Lord's Prayer tells us he's like a father. The story of the prodigal tells us he's like a dad, holding his arms out, waiting for that wayward child to come home. Psalm 23 tells us he's like the good shepherd. And yet our text for today gives us an unexpected twist to what God is like that may surprise us because in our text for today, we see that God is a businessman. God's a businessman and He's investing His resources for profit. You know what we call that in today's vernacular? God's a venture capitalist. Now that may be very difficult for you to understand, but as we go, I want you to understand God is a venture capitalist. In the parable, Jesus explained how the life is like a rich man going on a long journey. And as he got ready to go, he called together his servants and he gave them each a big sum of money, some bigger than others, with instructions what to do with it until he returned. Well, after the years went by, son of a gun, he did return. And he met with his employees. And some of his employees were rewarded and some were not. What's here to help us know is what God is like. We're going to look at this and we're going to see what God is like. And the first thing we have to understand is that all ownership, all ownership of everything is God's. It comes from God. You know, Psalm 24 puts it very, very plainly. The earth is the Lord and the fullness and thereof. I read a story while I was studying about a lawyer many years ago down in Louisiana who was asked to do a title search. John, you'll appreciate this. A title search for a piece of land being acquired by the Army for a base, an Army base. And he ran that title search all the way back to 1803 and he sent the title in. Well, the base commander looked at it, read it, and he wasn't satisfied, and he asked the lawyer to run the title search back even further. 
Well, the attorney complied and he wrote this in his reply to the 